I would like to welcome you all uh, to find out more about uh, John Mercer Langston. I'm Sheila Budoff. I'm with Arlington County's 55 plus program. And I'm very, very excited about today's program. Um, to start off, I have a confession to make, and that is when I first heard about the plan to rename Lee Highway, I didn't know all that much about John Mercer Langston. Uh, of course, I knew that um, the Langston Brown Community Center had been named after him, and I had quickly glanced at some of the plaques um, in the lobby, but it wasn't until I did my own research about him uh, that I got so excited and was so in awe of what an amazing man he was and how tremendously accomplished he was, especially considering uh, that he was an African American uh, and in the time um, that he lived, which was 1829 to 1897. Um, I found that his selection uh, for the new name was extremely fitting. I think we can all feel very proud when we look up at the new street signs uh, and know what a great man we are honoring. And I am absolutely delighted and honored uh, to welcome Sandra Green, who is going to tell us more about John Mercer Langston. And as you will hear, there really is no one more qualified for this task. Many thanks to Ginger Brown, Executive Director of the Langston Boulevard Alliance for suggesting that I reach out to Sandra. Sandra Green is a lifelong resident of the Halls Hill Highview Park neighborhood in Arlington. Uh, right out of college, uh, she began working as a community organizer with LBJ's Federal War on Poverty program in the 1960s. And after that, she had a decades long career uh, working for Arlington County Department of Parks and Recreation. She's been very involved in preserving Arlington's African-American history. Just to name a few of her many projects, uh, she has uh, been instrumental in getting a playground built uh, in tribute to the historical fire station number eight. Uh, she's gotten um, murals created uh, depicting life in Halls Hill and uh, also in getting a historical marker uh, recognizing the infamous Halls Hill segregation wall. Sandra is also uh, responsible for establishing Arlington County's annual tribute uh, or Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Um, this didn't come recently. This was 54 years ago, immediately following Dr. King's assassination, uh, long before any discussion of a national holiday. The purpose was to bring together the community in the aftermath of Dr. King's assassination. Sandra has received numerous honors from the county for her contributions. Uh, she was even included in an Arlington Public Library exhibit entitled Women's Work Then and Now, honoring women who dedicated their work to improve their community and the lives of others. And in 2014, Sandra received the Willard Britton Community Appreciation Award from the NAACP. Sandra is aptly described on the Halls Hill webpage as a living treasure of Arlington Black history knowledge. She's a member of the Langston Boulevard Alliance Community Advisory Committees at committee and served on the working group that, rename, that work to rename um, Lee Highway. Uh, we're gonna ask if you could please hold your questions until the end. You're more than welcome to enter your questions in the chat as we go along, but we will address them um, at the end. And at that point, uh, I can read the questions from the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and, and just ask your question. And so now, without further ado, I am, again, deeply honored and delighted uh, to have Sandra Green with us, and I'm going to turn over uh, the program to Sandra. Thank you, Sheila. 
um, just a correction, I was one of a group of people that initiated the Martin Luther King commemoration. Uh, it was a group of us that worked on that initiative. I was among that group. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And I'm really glad to be here today to share with you all. Uh, I'm gonna share with you information about John Mercer Langston. Information that hopefully will help you to understand uh, who he was and why a main thoroughfare in Arlington would be named in honor of him. Uh, during the presentation, I'm going to use a couple of readings from his autobiography, which has two names, from the Virginia plantation to the national capital, or the first and only Negro representative in Congress from the Old Dominion. And I'm going to be reading two excerpts from his book. And he uh, wrote this, finished his autobiography three years before he passed. Uh, let me begin by sharing with you that John Mercer Langston's life experiences were not the typical life experiences of other African-Americans during his lifetime. Uh, while he did face many challenges throughout his life, he had more resources, education, and support than most African-Americans during that time. It began with his birth. John Mercer Langston was born on December the 14th 1829 in Louisa County, Virginia, which is in the central part of Virginia, 15 miles west of Richmond and 15 miles east of Charlottesville. His father was a wealthy white plantation owner by the name of Captain Ralph Quarles. And uh, Mr. Quarles' views with regard to slavery and the management of slaves uh, was very different than most people uh, during that time. His views were just unusual. Uh, while he had slaves, he believed that slavery should be abolished. He believed uh, that the owner of slaves should have the autonomy to determine what that looks like to them as an individual. Ralph Quarles had no overseers for his slaves. He was the only white man that ever lived on his property. His slaves were divided into groups and they chose their own leaders. He was also different in that he chose a companion for life among his slaves who became the mother of his children. Her name was Lucy Langston. Together they had four children, one daughter Maria, and three sons, Gideon, Charles, and John. Lucy and her children um, lived next door to the home of Ralph Quarles. He provided a quality uh, education and all the necessities of life for his children. He filed emancipation papers for Lucy and their daughter, Maria. Both parents died in 1834. Uh, they were buried side by side on the plantation and at that time, John was four years old. Prior to his death, Ralph Quarles made arrangements for all of his children uh, to be taken care of. Uh, John and his brothers were moved uh, to Ohio, but in his will, Ralph Quarles had made provisions that all of the children be taken care of. He left everything that he could for his children. When John was 10 uh, and living with the Gooches who took excellent care of him, uh, Mr. Gooch, who was a friend of his father's, decided to move to Missouri. Uh, when he did, he asked John if he wanted to move with the family to Missouri and John gave an affirmative yes. During that move, when they were actually in journey to Missouri, they were interrupted by uh, a sheriff on horseback and one of John's half brothers who said that the courts had ordered them back to Chillicothe um, because Mr. Gooch had no 
right to remove John from Chillicothe. And some people in the town of Chillicothe felt that relocating John from Ohio, which was a free state, to Missouri, which was a slave holding state, would cause too many challenges for him. And the courts ruled in, in his brother's favor. So John did not go to Missouri uh, with the Gooch family as he so desperately wanted to go as a 10 year old because that's the only family that he had known for a while. At that time, he was then, a, uh, Mr. Richard Long, an abolitionist was appointed to be his guardian. And uh, he went to live with the Long family and he was treated very well. Um, but there was a real big difference in that John was expected to do some work. So during that time, he developed a real work ethic uh, and learned to perform many chores that would prove useful during his lifetime. Uh, after a couple of years with the Long family, John's brother Gideon sent him to Cincinnati for a better education. Uh, and he was an excellent student while he was in Cincinnati. At the age of, uh, his brothers always attended to him wherever he was because they promised their dad that they would always abide by his wish that John be educated. So at the age of 14, his brother sent him to Cincinnati that had a better educational system. And um, to go to Oberlin for one year to study um, because of their educational system. John excelled there. And after he returned, his brothers agreed that they would send him back as a full-time student at Oberlin College. Now, to understand the, uh, John's development for the next few years, it's real important to understand this Oberlin town uh, and what it was and how it helped to shape him as an individual. The town of Oberlin, Ohio was founded by two men, Phil O. P. Stewart and John P. Shippard, who were totally controlled by their religious beliefs. They set out to build an ideal community in city and college. Men and women and families who agreed with their ideals moved to Oberlin. Uh, then they had the Oberlin move, movement, uh, which said that the view, which explained their views and that they had extreme radical views on all matters of reform, religion, education, and anti-slavery. The Oberlin community and college accepted all persons of every nationality, native and foreign born, black and white, male and female. Oberlin College was the first institution of learning in the world to give women equal educational opportunities and advantages with men. Oberlin was the first college in the United States to accept the Negro student and give him equal educational opportunities and advantages with the white students. This is the environment that John M. Langston experienced while at Oberlin. Most African-Americans in the country at that time had none of these privileges. Here is an excerpt of John's uh, attempt to enter into law school after graduating from Oberlin College. He attempted to apply for various opportunities for law school, but was denied each time. So this is an excerpt from his book. At the age of 20, John M. Langston graduated from Oberlin College. He wanted to continue his education by attending law school. While he had proven to be academically ready, he was denied admission 
to all of the schools where he applied because of his race. He was encouraged by many to leave the United States and study in the British West Indy, Indian Islands or other countries who were more likely to permit him to study law. He was infuriated by the suggestion. He had a friend who had attended Oberlin with him and was studying law at Boston Spa, a law school owned and operated by a gentleman named J.W. Fowler. Even after his friend highly recommended Langston personally to Mr. Fowler, Langston was denied admission. Mr. Fowler encouraged him to appear in person to plead his case. So Langston did. This is Langston's account of the meeting. Afterward, young Langston called upon Mr. Fowler and renewed verbally with suitable explanation, his application for admission to the school. The principal promised him that his case should be fairly and impartially considered and decided. He said, however, it would have to be submitted to his board of trustees and his board of faculty. Accordingly, within the next 24 hours, Mr. Fowler called upon Mr. Langston at his hotel and after paying his respects to him, proceeded to give in full the adverse conclusion with the reason therefore, which had been reached in his case. Young Langston expressed his deep regret and his pro profound jargon in terms and manner, which seemed in some sense to move Mr. Fowler's feelings. You have my sympathy, he said, and I would be pleased to do something to help you in your studies. I tell you what I will do. I will let you edge your way into my school. Or if you will consent to pass as a Frenchman or Spaniard hailing from the West Indian Islands, Central or South Africa, uh, South America, I will take you into school. When he finished his statement, Mr. Langston asked, what Mr. Fowler do you mean by your words? Edge your way into the school. He answered, coming to the school, the recitation room, take your seat off and apart from the class and do so continue to do till you are taken and considered in due time as in full and regular membership. With the close of these words, Mr. Langston moved by a deep sense of humiliation of his manhood under the circumstances rising from his seat and yet in most respectful but feeling terms expressed himself in this manner. I thank you, Mr. Fowler, but, how, but however much I may desire to enter your school I will do so upon no terms or conditions of humiliation. I will not edge my way into your institution, nor will I yield my American birthright as a citizen of the United States, even in the pretense that I am a Frenchman or a Spaniard to gain that object. I was born in Virginia and upon a plantation. Neither of these facts will I deny. I expect to live as I hope to die in my own country, in the service of my own fellow citizens. Mr. Fowler, before I would consent to the humiliation and degradation implied in, neither of your prop in either of your propositions, I would open my veins and die of my own act. I am a colored American and I shall not prove false to myself, nor neglect the obligation I owe to the Negro race. You will pardon the vehemence and positiveness of my utterance. Mr. Fowler heard Mr. Langston, no feeling was exhibited on his part. However, he finally said, you have my sympathy but I cannot take you as a student. 
To this, the young man made prompt reply. I do not need sympathy. I need the privileges and, to, and advantages of your law school. Here, the interview was ended. At this time, John was advised by many of his peers to um, attend, go back and attend Oberlin um, and to major in theology. And they felt that by his going back to Oberlin, it may give him more of an opportunity to enter into law school. He did. Um, and when he went back to Oberlin, he studied under a, a gentleman and at the age of 21, he passed the bar exam. He finished his studies in theology and then he studied at Mr. Philemon Bliss's law firm, who was a white well-known lawyer. And at 21, he was told that he was ready to take the exam to be a lawyer. So here's an interesting point. Although he had passed the exam, he had to go through the procedures to be admitted into the bar. So that process included uh, five individuals to deem him eligible to be admitted into the bar. Now, some of the members of the committee suggested verbally that John M. Langston was a colored man. But all five of them, they, they knew that he was. So it would be difficult for him to be admitted into the bar even though he had all of the qualifications because the law in that time at Ohio said that there were to be no colored lawyers. There had been no colored lawyers in the United States ever at that time. Um, prior to John M. Langston, there had been no African-Americans to attend law school. So that was not a precedent at the time. So when it was time for him to be examined, to be admitted to the bar, some of the people who were responsible for that process did not take it seriously at all because they felt that even if he were admitted to the bar, he would never be able to practice in their jurisdictions because most of the places a lot of the places in Ohio would never have permitted that. Those towns would just never have permitted that. And the chief justice who was working with his becoming uh, uh, admitted to the bar was one of those individuals. So two of the others who were working to get him admitted and who were friends of his used the language that was written at the time to secure John M. Langston's ability to be admitted to the bar because it was not written in any of the documentations where he was promoted that he was a Negro. It was only expressed verbally. So the chief justice who didn't really care because he didn't think his town would ever be affected uh, or that John M. Langston would ever appear in his town proceeded in this direction. He asked John M. Langston to stand. 
And then he asked him to come forward. And he did, he got up and he, he went forward to be sworn. But he, John and Langston inquired and asked why did he have to stand? He was told that it was material to know by actual sight what his color was by actual sight. For in order to his admission to the bar under the Ohio law, he must be construed into a white man as he was at once upon sight. John Mercer Langston had a lot of features of a white man and could have passed in many instances. No one at that point said anything about him not being a white man, so he was sworn in. And on September the 13th in 1854, he was admitted to the Ohio bar. In the early years of his practice, he only had white clients. Um, he moved to areas where most of his clients would normally be white because he would often be the only African-American in that area. Uh, many African Americans did not have any financial means to pay for legal representation at that time. But more so, uh, they knew that they would ultimately be judged by an all white jury and a judge. So they did not seek legal representation. Eventually, Mr. Langston began to represent larger issues um, that negatively impacted African-Americans in the, the United States. He married a fellow student from Oberlin named Carolyn Wall, who was from Harveysburg, North Carolina. They moved to many communities throughout Ohio where Langston often set up law offices um, and became active in politics. One of those communities was Browham Township. It was here that John M. Langston became the first colored man ever nominated in the United States to an office and who was elected on a popular vote. He was elected to serve as the town clerk. John M. Langston and his wife, Lucy, would have five children. His mission in life was always to get involved in issues and hold positions that enabled him to positively impact the lives of African-Americans. Here are some of those accomplishments. Before the Civil War, he actively assisted runaway slaves along the Underground Railroad. He also helped and supported John Brown's raid on Hopper's Ferry. Langston called upon the federal government to grant African-American men the right to vote. He became the leader of the National Equal Rights League in 1864. Following the Civil War, he joined the Freedmen's Bureau, serving as the agency's educational inspector. In 1868, he organized the Law School of Howard University. From 1875 to 1883, Langston served as the United States Council General to Haiti. He became president of the Virginia Normal and Collegiate Institute, now known as Virginia State University. In 1888, he won election to the United States House of Representatives. He was the first African-American from Virginia to be elected to the US Congress. He also became the first African-American to practice law before the United States Supreme Court. 
Langston spent the last years of his life as a resident in Petersburg, Virginia, but he also maintained a home in Washington where he and his wife spent most of their time entertaining their friends. He had a huge volume of literature that he had acquired over 50 years. He died in 1897 at the age of 68. He is buried in Washington, DC. And John M. Langston was the un uncle of Langston Hughes. While he did not endure some of the harsh realities of life of most African Americans, he always worked to better the lives of his people. Many schools have been named in his honor to include John M. Langston School, which is now Langston Brown Community Center, a part of that building. And we now have Langston Boulevard. So hopefully this information has helped you to understand who John M. Langston was and why there would be a main thoroughfare renamed in his honor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. I really appreciate mm -hmm. your filling us in and, and painting the picture of this amazing and unique man uh, especially for his time. Um, let's see if there are questions yet in the chat. Uh, nope. So I will lead it off um, with a question. I think one thing I may have found, it's a question, is um, John Langston's connection to Arlington. When he worked for the Freedmen's Bureau, was he the education inspector for Freedmen's Village? Is that? I, my understanding is that he was. Um, and from some of the things that I have read, he visited Freedmen's Village here in Arlington as the, an inspector. So that is one of the, that is his tie in to Arlington. Okay, now we have the question streaming in. Uh, do you know how John M. Langston spent his time during the Civil War? That's an interesting question. Well, it, it he, he was doing a lot of things during that time um, to work to help the cause of, of emancipation, um, freedoms for African-Americans. And he, he was just always doing a lot in his life politically uh, and as an educator. He did a lot of oratorical um, presentations all over the South, all over the North to political groups, to in churches, anyone that would have him to present his perspective and his urge for the country to do the right thing. And I'm going to put this book up in his autobiography, which is here. It has all of the nuances of everything that he was doing during every period of his life. This book was written in the third person. Nowhere does he say, I or me, it's always in the third person. He refers to himself descriptively as to what he was doing at that time in his life. The lawyer, the student, the son, um, but it also shares all of the times that he was involved in presenting something orally around the country. And it was during that time that he had many, many oral presentations um, to the government when they would listen about his, his stance. Uh, another question in the chat is, um, what district uh, did John Langston represent in Virginia? 
Was okay. it uh, Louisa County or? You know, I, I would have to look that up. I do not know right off the top of my head uh, which district he represented. But I think it, it, uh, it was Louisa County. Yeah. I know it was not Arlington, if, if that's no, the no, 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 direction no. of the question. He really didn't have all that much uh, connection to no. Arlington, per se. He lived in that area of uh, Petersburg. And uh, at that time, I think he had gone back to Louisa County. That makes sense. And uh, so some of these things I could can't keep in my head. But I would urge people to get this book if they want details because it has all of the details. Okay, um, we have another question. Uh, when did he return to Virginia? Uh, I don't know the year. Um, he was back and forth. Um, I think it was is it was close to the time that he was elected into Congress, but he was always back and forth. He maintained a home in Washington. He had a home in Petersburg and he had a home in Louisa County. So he was kind of, he was traveling around as he was needed. Uh, another question is uh, how far south on Route 29 has now been renamed Langston Boulevard. Does it end at the Fairfax County line or does it, I, I, I know it's not. No, Langston it goes up to, County. It, it ends at um, where the sign says Falls Church. And I think that's right across 66. There's a sign that says Falls Church. Yes. Because that's where it becomes, uh, what is that street up there? What is it now? It ends as Langston Boulevard and it picks up as maybe West Street. I don't know. But that's where it ends there. Okay. So it doesn't right. it doesn't it come into Fairfax there. County. No, it does not. Because I know they're trying to decide they're what they're gonna yeah. as as are the people on the other end of the highway, which was Oldie Highway, they're making a decision as to what mm -hmm. that will be renamed. Interesting. So it's just a short corridor. Interesting. Um, we have a question. If you could please uh, tell us some more about Langston and the Freedmen's Bureau in Arlington. Thanks. Well, the Freed, I can, I don't know much about because nowhere does it talk in depth about him doing any particular thing in Arlington. Uh, he was the person that oversaw all of the educational things that went in these established communities. Freedman's Village was one of several organized communities by the federal government for people who had come out of slavery, for them to be um, organized and mainstreamed and for them to receive services uh, in order to make that transition easier. And one of the things that they had in most of these um, communities was education. And John M. Langston oversaw what that looked like, curriculum, teachers, everything that had to do with education. But I have not read anywhere where it specifically says that he did something unique or different in Arlington. Um, okay, we have um, a clarification um, in the chat that Route 29 is called Washington Street in Washington Falls Church. Street. That's, That's right. I knew it was a W. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. Yeah, does he have any other connection to Arlington beyond Freedman's Village? No, um, well, you know, the only connection that I can share is that, of course, Langston School was named after him. Ah. And when, um, when Langston 
was built, I believe, I'm going to say 1924. I think that's the correct year. Um, there had been several schools in the Highview Park community. There was Sumner School One, Sumner School Two. Um, they were housed in, uh, one of them was housed in a church. One of them was housed in a fraternal um, organization, little clubhouse. And then there was this initiative in the community to build a school. And um, when John M. Langston School was built, the land there was, don't, was um, land that belonged to Basil Hall that he sold to the county for them to build a school. And the school was built as a result of funding by uh, a foundation. And I can't remember the name right now. It's something Rosenwald or something foundation. Ah, Rosenwald School. And, and he built many, many schools. Langston was one of those schools. And the condition that it was built under was that any school built with that foundation's money, the community had to raise uh, money to demonstrate that they were really committed. And Highview, uh, which was Halls Hill then, raised enough money to qualify to have a school built. So they had an opportunity to suggest a name for the school. And um, they overwhelmingly suggested John M. Langston because people at that time in Halls Hill knew of John M. Langston. Um, he was one of the heroes to people in African-American communities. And, you know, he had been involved in Freedman's Village. He was, had uh, founded the law school in Howard. So people knew about him. So they overwhelmingly suggested John M. Langston as the name for the school. And even today, while the recreation, the community center portion of the building is Langston Brown, the school, which houses the alternative high school program is still John M. Langston. That is so fascinating that the Langston School was a Rosenwald school. That mm -hmm. is amazing. Julius Rosenwald was the head of Sears Roebuck. Um, he took it over when it was basically going down the tubes into bankruptcy, and he took it over and built it up into the amazing uh, empire that it was. Um, and yes, he um, partnered. He was very much inspired by Booker T. Washington, and the two of them partnered on these Rosenwald schools. And exactly as you said, Sandra, he, his foundation put up money, but also there was an insistence that the community work and give money to build the schools because they would only care about them if they were invested in them. And uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful partnership. Julius Rosenwald built some 5,000 schools, unfortunately segregated schools, but he recognized the difference in the levels of education that uh, black people and white people were receiving and saw as is consistent with the theme uh, in, in uh, John Langston's life, the importance of education exactly. in, 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 in furthering people and, and helping them to move to the next level. And it, it was that commitment to education that's absolutely consistent. I hadn't realized that we have a Rosenwald School right in Arlington. That's mm -hmm. phenomenal, yes. phenomenal. Uh, we have a question. Uh, when and how did John Langston obtain his status as a free man? You know, he, when, All of that happened when he moved, he and his brothers, he was the youngest, um, when they moved to Ohio. And his brothers, while they were looking after his 
uh, him to be educated and to have all the things that he should have, they were also working for all of them be to become free men. So they took care of that part of the process. And all of his brothers were, they didn't become as famous as John M. Langston, but they all had very, very solid careers and lived profitable lives, all, all of them did. His sister married and had, uh, it's written that she had 21 children. That's what it's written in the book. <laughs> and his father lived to, to, um, uh, to select his daughter's husband. So her, um, the plantation owner selected his daughter Maria's husband. But she too moved to Ohio. That's where they all resided. And Ohio made the process of becoming free much more uh, easy than other jurisdictions. It was not as difficult. Ohio was very, very progressive. Mm -hmm. And I think was one of the places where the Underground Railroad would go. Um, and of course, Oberlin College is still today a very liberal and progressive uh, college. So that's totally consistent. It's at the forefront. Uh, we have another great question uh, in the chat. Who is Brown of Langston Brown Community Center? Who is Brown? Brown, Brown is, is Lillian Brown. She was a community activist here in Halls Hill and she became the executive director of the Arlington Community Action Program and Head Start. Uh, she started Head Start here in Arlington, um, but she went on to become the executive director and spent many years working in Arlington to eradicate poverty. And she was uh, lived here in Halls Hill, grew up in Halls Hill. So that's where the Brown comes in in Langston Brown. Thank and if you. you if you go into Langston and you enter the side of the building where the parking lot is, uh, and if you look to your left when you enter that door, there is a plaque and a picture of Lillian Brown that um, is on display there and that tells of her prominence in the community. Fascinating, fascinating. <laughs> this was absolutely fascinating, Sandra. I really, really appreciate your taking your time, the time out from your very busy schedule to talk with us and paint a picture for us of John Mercer Langston. Um, he truly was amazing and uh, I really appreciate it. This was fabulous. I think I know I feel very proud when I look up at the street signs and I see the name Langston and I know who he was and I feel like this was such an appropriate choice of a great man. My, I commend you highly, Sandra, and the members of the working group of the Langston Boulevard Alliance um, to recommend um, John Langston to be honored in this way. I feel it's just so totally fitting so appropriate. Um, he, he's truly merited it, and it's a wonderful choice. Thank you for joining us, Sandra. Thank you all for joining us out in Zoom land. We really appreciate it. Um, this has been wonderful, Sandra. Thank you. Thank this you so much for having me. Fabulous feedback in the chat. Uh, thanks so much, so much to learn. Thanks for a very interesting presentation. Thank you so much for an outstanding presentation. Truly amazing. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I enjoyed.